Welcome to Welcome to Welcome to, Welcome to the new cast hosted by Reva from New from New Life. Hey guys, welcome to the Newcast. This is Riva Ochuba. I'm the cultural director of New Life, a social application that transfers cultural data into digital assets. And today we're going to have a conversation with Winston Chmielinski, and he's a painter, um, the director of cultural science at New Life, and former assistant to Weiwei, research assistant to be specific. And today we're going to talk about um, aesthetic conservatism through the eyes of Russell Kirk, as well as like some other things about whether postmodernity is a conservative ethos and things of that nature. Um, Winston, would you like to introduce yourself? I think you did it pretty clearly. Yeah, just happy to be here. Hi, everyone. <laughs> just, okay, just happy to be here. We love that. <laughs> okay, uh, <laughs> so um, <laughs> recently, I, recently, I wrote a, recently I wrote a piece for New Life on New Life's Medium um, titled uh, titled The Economies of Cultivation Somewhere Between Science and Sentiment. And what got me thinking about this is um, Russell Kirk is considered to be an, like, an imaginative conservative where he's not necessarily conservative due to like any political partisanship. He's conservative because he's really into the idea of preser preserving beauty in whichever form it takes shape, yeah. whether it's like a, po like, even if it is a political alliance, it's like maintaining the like, the, the integrity and dignity of that alliance rather than it going into any extreme that, that completely obliterates uh, the philosophical components that, that keep it more ethereal or sentimental. Um, and also respecting tradition is something that he was really, really into. Um, and in this piece, I also talked about why this is important to the future of, I'd say, te technological spaces and, and techno-feudalism because um, If we allow ourselves to be taken so completely out of out of traditional frameworks, or or I'd say notarize social concepts for the sake of like the future or this constant like exterior reality, then then we'll lose touch with the civility that comes with uh, human nature or certain ontologies that keep us in existence uh, in a in a dignified way. And um, I shared the article with you, and I, and I wanted to get your opinions about it, and maybe we can just start the discussion from there. Yeah, um, well, I actually I was going to ask you the question of where, like, where that article came about for you, but you just answered it pretty clearly. Um, it's interesting because it really circles around this idea of essential values of, of what you just said, like human connection and keeping that alive within the techno space. And I just wonder, at the same time, at New Life, we've been tossing around this word postmodern a lot. And you know, there's something about the, the complete relativism of postmodernity that I think is not, it doesn't speak to the next level of somehow integrating the humanist, but also keeping the flexibility of, of what this digital global landscape is really looking like. I agree with you 100% because I think postmodernism does this like squeezing thing. It squeezes the essentialism out of everything but completely delineates from from uh, everything around it that makes it divine. Like, you know, you can't have an orange without an orange tree and you can't you, you know, you can't you can't just like completely remove the orange and then and then completely forget about how that orange came to pass. Um, and I think postmodernism attempts to do that in a, in a very detrimental way. Yeah, and I think one of the thirsts that people feel these days is this, this desire for something to hold on to because it's so fast, the rate of recycling. And, and when we were talking before, you know, you mentioned that postmodern doesn't really bring anything new. It just kind of is a remix, 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 remix. But that speed of remixing has really, I think, exhausted a lot of people. And that's why we see the reemergence of wanting to find some kind of identity um, and, and I mean, the, the sad reemergence is, is kind of postmodern conservatism, conservatism, which is just like hardcore latching back on to something, something that is an identity, which feels like a big regression in that sense. It does feel like a big regression. There was a, a there was a talk on Jacobin about how postmodernism is like a huge intellectual step back because it doesn't encourage any new 
any new innovative thought. It's all about being really anachronistic and kind of living in this kind of perpetuity, living in this kind of constant um, revival of something that doesn't necessarily need to be readministered. Like it's like we can't ever let go and allow something to mature and, and, and cease for something new to emerge. We're just constantly like holding on to a past that no longer serves us. Yeah, and then because we have these super active minds, we're like trying to make sense of it all and having conversations around authenticity and what's authentic, but it's really, it's also, I feel really exhausted when it's like, we're <laughs> if we just take a step back from that whole dialogue uh, or the whole dialectics around authenticity, um, of course it's impossible to find right now because because there is no, Th we're, we're not tracing any inherent relationships between things. We've severed those. And, it, and it's a little sad that even though postmodernity is kind of this revolt against modernity in many ways, it carries through this, this um, separatism guised by pure relationalism, if that makes sense. Pure relationalism. But at the same time, we, we've ended relationalism because everything is like, we've replaced everything with nothing. When something goes into right. post, it's like dead. But then, okay, if it's dead, then what's, it's like we're constantly, like I said before in our talk, it's like this hauntology. It's like we're just, we're just like living it like through ghosts. Yeah, like, okay. You know, like <laughs> hauntology, okay, that's nice. I thought it was just like a heavy breathing on ontology, but that's really nice, hauntology. <laughs> no, <Well> it's <laughs> Derrida's uh, uh, framework about how we just, um, like I was thinking, like like everyone's talking about post COVID, post gnome core, post luxury, but then it's like, okay, what's gonna replace these things? Like, yeah. why, wh and why are we so obsessed with being like past things? Like, why do we have to move through things so quickly? As you said, this like need to remix and recycle. Why can't we just let something be, um, and allow it to kind of take shape and mature naturally? And like, why are we so obsessed with everything? Kind of, it's like. We don't, we, we like force things to cycle out. We don't allow them to cycle out. It's like we're trying to rush and rummage through everything and then we're kind of, and then we reach this like end. It's like reaching the end of a highway. It's like you were going 60 miles an hour on the highway and then you just hit the end and you're like, oh, I wasn't ready for that. <laughs> <laughs> you know? You're like, yeah. I wasn't ready to stop driving, but oh, but there's no road left. Yeah. What comes first, hitting the end or burning out before you make it to that point? I think both are kind of uh, plaguing. <laughs> plaguing us right now. Well, you have, I, I think I, I, it could be a little bit of both, but you have to ask yourself, what was I seeking so quick? What was I seeking in the first place? You know, like when you essentialize everything, you have to wonder, but what was the point of me doing that? It's like squeezing all the, like, okay, when you squeeze an orange for the juice, you, you're, you, you're hoping to drink that juice. But if you're just squeezing it, to squeeze it, <laughs> I'm like, <laughs> then what? You're just kind of like wasting. You're just yeah. kind of like. So what? What do you think? Like, how would you respond to that? What we've been squeezing. What are we? What are we trying? What? Why? I mean, I think in our search for the truth, we kind of like obliterated our ability to see it. It's like if, if you're looking, if you're constantly looking for beauty, constantly looking for the essential, uh, uh, constantly looking for the heart of something you're never going to find it you know you're never you're never going to find what you consistently seek you'll always overlook it yeah so yeah, kind of um, <coughs> i've been thinking a lot about this in 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 a, in a it's the same thing but a different terminology around like the things that now okay so sometimes i go to the train station and i just sit there and I like watch people go in directions and I find it very calming because I get to believe that I have, I've like found a spot and I can like sit there and everyone else is going somewhere and I actually have found my spot and it's like I'm suddenly not competing. And I notice a lot of my friends who are, they've, they've gone past the emerging state of artists and, and they're kind of established and there's it's like the same thing is happening on multiple in multiple dimensions I've also seen that happen with a certain like aesthetic that's emerged from 
Instagram where it's like really spacious things. Like uh, one of my friends has put has started to to collect these old filters and put them over cameras and just create like fields. And then she just disappeared from Instagram completely. And I think it's a really it's like a really interesting privilege to be able to disappear. But mm-hmm. One thing that that makes me think about at New Life is, is um, you know, here we are with this digital, with this digital semantic web of, of, of connecting things. And we're also trying to introduce metrics of, of new metrics of evaluation of, you know, mm-hmm. when, you, when I sit down and I really think about who has contributed value for me, and then I check on Instagram and see where they sit, there's a huge discrepancy. And those metrics of value become something that are not reflected in the speed at which you've navigated the web or how many followers you have or whatever that is. And, and I think, bring, oh, oh, go ahead. I, I think that possibly comes from value becoming a transactional thing. Like social interactions are transactional, but the creation of value doesn't necessarily have to be, right? Like I, I think the creation of value is or, or the true, I'd say, creation of value without, com- without compromise isn't necessarily seeking a transaction. It's all about like internal affirmation, I think, um, and realization. But then once you, t- like this is what we talked about when you were an artist or you were painting and then your gallery was like, oh, we want to keep you making the stuff you're making. But then they were like, but actually we know what sells the best, so maybe you should just make that stuff. And then it actually it just keeps like, it, yeah, they, they essentialize you. They squeeze the juice out of you. And then they were like, oh, but, and then they're upset that it's not as like exciting as it once was somehow. But it's like, yeah. you kind of, and that yeah. also does something to the person that's creating the work too, because you start to, you, you also kind of gentrify yourself for the sake of, of, of like, um, supplying value to this to this other orifice. So where does okay, so so that kind of highlights this this aspect of value and this aspect of also the the self and the contribution or the creation of something. There's this mysterious quotient involved. And so what do we do with mystery and the blockchain or like what do we <laughs> like how do we how do we start to investigate that mystery without squeezing further and further and further and further is it important but this is the economy mm-hmm. no go ahead i think this is the economy of cultivation though this is what i was getting at it's like people have i think people have a misconstrued idea of what capital is especially in relation to social capital social capital in relation to actual like money or the ability to accrue monetary sustenance there is a gap there but people think that because you have a certain amount of instagram followers or a certain amount of um, approving social interactions that immediately translates to um being able to sustain yourself which is why everyone's after so many subscribers so many followers so many likes etc 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 but that's genuinely not the case it's genuinely not the case Social value gives you the oppor- or cultural value or cultural capital or clout gives you the opportunity to manifest money or to create money, but it does not owe you money. And I think people have this like miss this misconnection there. So it does give you the opportunity to collaborate, to create, to produce, and to create value that you would hope would become monetary monetarily sustainable, but it does not always lead to that. And if mm. people took those two things and placed them aside from each other and really harnessed their true abilities with the, with the cultural capital they have, harnessed them with well intentions, then they can, at the end of the day, produce the value that they're actually trying to achieve. Mm. I, in my opinion. In my yeah. very humble opinion. <laughs> I follow that. I think, I think you've, you've uh, relayed that idea very, very beautifully. Thank you. I've been thinking about it for a while. (laughs) (laughs) But I I think that is what it is. I was talking to someone about this, like there is a gap. There is a gap that I think these platforms have uh, done a a really great job of masking. Yeah. 
Yeah. And that's because they are actually they're actually living in their own intentions, which is why they make so much money. But they want you to conform to their their intentions so that you create value for them. But they're just doing what they were going to do anyway. Like they're it's they're not they don't need us at this point. So they're just kinda like da 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 da. Just keep working for us, be futile. Yeah. <laughs> and and what keeps people in there who aren't benefiting from it? You don't know any other way. A lot of this is about releasing people from the opportunity of having options, which is actually to constrict them. When you believe that you can only live in the cyclical loop of YouTube, Twitter, Instagram, TikTok, YouTube, it, Twitter, Instagram, TikTok, and that there's nothing outside of that that you can do to, uh, there's something outside of that you can contribute to to make a well-being for yourself or to make a life for yourself, then if you can't beat them, you join them against your own behest. Yeah. That's like the, that's, those are the options you have, which is why New Life is another, is, is I think a great platform for the leveraging of actual opportunity. Right. Not pretend, not pretend opportunity. Yeah, I, I'd love to hear from someone who like really, really loves TikTok. <laughs> because, <laughs> you know, because like in a weird way, if I, if I pretend to imagine like what someone's experience is on there, I feel like there's also a level of people being so out of touch with creative agency that when a platform gives you something to respond to, it activates something essential around wanting to participate creatively, but at the same time it also diminishes what your creative capabilities are. So. I think it's a really co-op strategy of a platform to be like, you can be a dancer too, like you can make amazing memes. And then people are like, oh my God. And it fits, it fits their, their self-limiting but perceived capacity for creati creativity as a response to like a, a global joke. And that's a really, you know, something that really interests me about New Life is how how to cultivate also creative agency in a limitless way. So a diversity of things that can exist on a, or that can communicate on a deeper level of expressiveness as opposed to just responsiveness. Or reactiveness. Reactiveness, I guess. yeah. yeah. I, I think that's a, that's a really poignant point because I was I actually earlier today recorded a episode about virtuality and how I think you I think TikTok has done a really great job of creating its own utopia because it has very very structured directives that you that, that you can participate in and, and there are only there are very few ways in which you can be successful on that platform you don't get to just kind of like on Instagram when Instagram was I'd say around 2014-2015 when it's becoming a, I'd say a greater player in the field of, of, of socializing, you can kind of do anything on Instagram until it found out what it was supposed to be doing. But TikTok is extremely postmodern in the fact that it was like, okay, we're going to do Vine and we're going to, okay, we see people are doing these dance challenges, but we're going to make that the ocular thing here. We're going to make that the ocular thing. And if you want to succeed here, you have to have beauty, talent, and we're also going to do this TikTok house. So people who are beautiful, talented as dancers will be able to live in this virtual reality and you guys all can watch. Right, and if you're good enough, then you can, you can participate. And then there was also a point in TikTok when they had this wallet where you can make money off of like, if people wanted to watch you sleep, then you could earn tokens. Were you around when that was happening? No. <laughs> this was like earlier this year. And so they kind of really facilitated this, like how, like kind of how useless can you be on this platform and generate as much like value as possible? But that only works in a utopian way. If you allow too many, if you allow too many oppositional perspectives to exist in that ecosystem, it would not be as successful as it is. You know, you have to. It has to really be concentrated, saturated, but also extremely concentrated in, in its focus, um, which is, which is kind of like, it's almost presenting itself as like a game, in that way. I think. Mm. Um, but as you said, not everyone can dance. I certainly can't. 
<laughs> so, so I'm kind of, I'm, t- I'm a bit turned off by this idea, but then I don't know where else to go. I feel like I should be participating in this, and I don't know how to participate in this. So does that mean that I'm not... It feels a little bit like eugenics, to be completely yeah. honest. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it feels a little bit like eugenics. Like I'm not... Like, like I'm feeble-minded. I'm too feeble-minded to, to participate in this game. Yeah, I don't think feeble-minded is the right thing, but yeah. <laughs> that's what eugenics, that's what the, that was a eugenic term, to be like okay. feeble-minded. So yeah. I'm not, uh, I would never call myself feeble-minded. <laughs> yeah, um, that's, that's, uh, that's eugenics. I mean, <laughs> I'm sorry. I hadn't thought of it that but way, it's, but yeah, it's, it is. Mm. It's an aesthetic cleansing. It's like an aesthetic cleansing. It's like you have to, like shed yourself shed like a portion of your skin to really participate in this like um in this reality yeah which is which is really interesting i mean there's nothing necessarily wrong with that but then it's like is that work like that feels like consumption more than it feels like work it's like in order to participate in this i have to i have to what would you say about this, if you could speak about it further? I feel like it's a weird way to consume while also producing at the same time. Yeah. And alienating. Well, <laughs> it's kind of like if we could get rid of our digestive system and just attach our throat to our ass and just like shoot things through, that's the kind of consumption that I think is quite in the long run, it just depletes you of, of everything that that makes you um, that makes you like human because it it it's this funnel of it basically turns you into a machine a fun a funnel like a not like a very low quality machine that doesn't have to do any processing it just funnels it right through and that's yes that's consumption and pro- that's that's the production of consumption if that if that's you know, what you were getting at. Yes, you're ready in yourself. You've like streamlined yourself in a way that where you could be easily digested and easily consumed. That's exactly yeah. what it is. Yeah. That's exactly what it is. Thank you so much for pointing that out. And that's where the speed comes from because you're basically just hooking, you're basically just putting a tube through you and just shooting things through and it like is never satisfying. Like if you don't digest, you will never be satisfied. You'll literally just keep eating and eating and eating and eating and eating. Under the auspices which is why the, of, of making, of producing something. Which is true, which is why the economy of cultivation is about, like you said, process. Because through process you find actual satisfaction. When you do something and you do it well and, and you... you st- when you stick to a process and, and you're not necessarily sure of what the outcome will be, but you're devoted to, to producing something that um, is done with your own hands and your own mind and your own creative ability. Yeah then you're ultimately satisfied with the result. You can walk away feeling like a bit, a bit, uh, sati- you could walk away feeling satiated. But if you felt like you had to cut a corner or kind of um, diminish the, you know, diminish some portion of it or some part of it for the sake of the, the larger platform you're, you're aestheticizing yourself toward or funneling yourself through, then you're kind of like, you kind of want to keep trying because you feel like you never got the chance to really see it to fruition. Yeah. And the weird and the weird illusion of it all is that it looks so embodied because it's literally people dancing, but it's the least embodied thing you can do. Because it's having a body, hollow. it is extremely hollow. Yeah. Having a body is, if we're gonna actually, you know, start to work with our bodies, it means that we have to shape things in the ways that our bodies can. And that, to me, is also what digestion or what integration is. It's that you might get a tidbit of information. But just because your body is configured in a certain way, not to draw that polarity, but just because like, there's this physical process of things that are slow and moving around and changing and alchemizing, it's going to come out in a unique way. And when we lose that uniqueness, which only comes through digestion and integration, we lose a sense of what, we lose a sense of, of having actually done anything with our time and our attention. Yeah, bud. <laughs> That's pretty much what it is. <laughs> yeah. And I think 
Russell Kirk was very, very anti that. He was very like anti. How can I say this plainly? He kind of liked to watch the ugliness of, of becoming. Because that is the most interesting thing of any process. Like when I was a fashion designer and I made my first collection, that process was like glorious for me because I was, there were ideas I had in my head that I really wanted to put out. And you know, when you're actually, you think you have an idea, but when you actually start configuring a piece or, or patterning a particular garment, you might have things you want to tweak as you're doing that process. And it, it, it grows into something a little more interesting than you initially thought in your, in your, in your like, in your original like concept and you watch that grow and change and morph and become and transform and you're like this is kind of better than what I I ever hoped it would be but I just kind of I wasn't expecting that at all I was just kind of like doing my own thing and that's kind of really that is what people I think are missing even I personally chose not to go to, for my fashion design degree, I chose not to go to a well-known school because I didn't want my thought process to be inhibited by uh, that of a well-known institution. I didn't want that kind of spiritual cleansing for myself. I wanted to go through that process on my own, in my own way, and make my own stumbles and failures, not to be directed into a lane of success, but to kind of be allotted the room to really fail a few times in my own unique way. Yeah. Uh, and a lot of the platforms that we're engaging in, there is no room for failure. You're not, you're not experimenting. You're more so than anything seeking ways to avoid failure. But failure yeah. is the most interesting thing you can do. You should fail. I mean, it's so cliche. You should really fail hard and fail often and fail in very extreme ways yeah. if you can't if, afford to. Well, it seems like we can afford at least you know, the, in the, the ways in which we continually fail on, on this planet, there's a, lot of, there's a lot of wiggle room for failure built into this system. And, so and there a has to be- a certain kind of failure though. What? Um, are you saying it's a certain kind of failure or failure allotted for certain systems? I, I'm a little like, confused. Oh, I'm just saying that, that we have not been the most efficient in just, th just thinking in terms of like uh, pollution and, and such for this planet. There's a lot of room for a lot of failure slash destructive behavior because that seems to be the way that we learn things. And mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I, it would be amazing if at some point like you could plug a chip in your head and like get it. <laughs> but. I know for myself, and just what you were talking about with your process of, of making clothes, the concept can turn around and you can, you can see all the little things you're going to do, but until you actually jump in and start to touch things, it's like you actually discover so much more through that pendulum swing back and forth between ideation and physical manipulation. And, and it, is, it is funny yeah. to talk about it because it is really cliche, but at the same time, I think it's the source of so much um, personal stagnation in this world that there's a lot of resistance to, because there is such an onslaught of information that kind of, you know, you can read a whole bunch of stuff and, and why would you ever slow down that process of learning by actually having to stop and incorporate, but at the same time, that imbalance of knowledge versus executing it or, or integrating it is where I think a lot of just loss of, of sovereign creativity comes from and the resulting kind of um, ills of like, what do I do with my life? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's definitely easy to ask that question when it seems like being a TikTok dancer is a valuable means of income. You, you have to ask yourself, like, what can I do that it's, I, what did I read today? I was like, until we're able to appreciate like artisanal works or, or sovereign means of production, we're going to continue, we're going to continue to live in this loop. We're going to continue to live in this loop where we drain the value out of everything that we absolutely have and are incapable of seeing truth, beauty, divinity, or anything worthwhile. 
Yeah. We're just going to erase ourselves. Because we, we genuinely throw all of our energy into these alternative zones. They're not, alter- they're not autonomous zones, as we discussed previously. They're just alternative zones that don't necessarily give anything back to us besides something that feels it's a figment of I, I'd say retribution likes follows blah 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 but it doesn't necessarily give back anything it's kind of a weird codependency we have on these like dopamine hijackers I think yeah, yeah. Um, which once again keeps us from being able to think sovereignly because you're consistently being pushed into a group of, you're consistently being grouped or producing content to appease a group or appease a larger power that you're not necessarily sure has, that you're not necessarily aware has, has, you're not aware that this larger power has a hold on you or you're kind of complicit to the hold it has on you. So you're, you, yeah, you're living in this kind of like limbo constantly of like, what is me? What is being harnessed from me? What are people expecting of me? What, but there's no room to, ask yourself but who am i yeah like actually and and i think also scaling your like scaling creativity or scaling your creative production is also baked into a lot of um a lot of i I don't want to call it education around art but just kind of the narrative around like if i if i i'm thinking i'm thinking literally about a box I just got today, and it was a it was a birthday present that got lost and then found, thankfully. And it was it's from a really dear friend of mine, and she she like made this shirt with all of these stitches, and I mean it's totally crazy. Like it, it, it's not. <laughs> Let me I, I could get it. Let me just get it. <clears throat> I'll be back in a second. I'm gonna eat a peach. <laughs> nice. And you're actually gonna bite it and not just squeeze it, right? Oh, that's pretty so nutty. <laughs> so she, like, is incredibly. I mean, she, she like hand, you know, like hand manipulated all of this fabric and like, it's, it's a lot of her in here and it's not gonna, it, you know, it's not, it doesn't go anywhere when you make, when you make one piece for somebody. But, but that feeling of like receiving and, and the, I'm not saying it well because I'm, I'm like feeling it, right? I'm like really feeling it right now. <laughs> but it's, it's that thing. It, again, like even I'm catching myself and I'm like, Winston, you're so cliche. Like you're so, you're being so cliche right now. It's so cliche. But this is also the thing. It's like when you think about Russell Kirk and his like, his like, his like uh, affinity for, for tradition and the, having the affinity for tradition is is kind of like finding a comfort in the cliche because cliches are kind of always true they're more often than not true that's why they're, that's why they're so cliche and i and i hate saying that because even that statement is a cliche <laughs> it's so true but it yeah so true it had, like i, I th- and i think i honestly think we're arriving at a point where we can kind of laugh at our at our walls that we've drawn up against like <laughs> Things being cliche and true. And I notice that also with a lot of images of just like more smiles, more like, uh, okay, I'm tired. More too. joy. Like, a little more, more joy. joy. And, <laughs> and for like, that to not be a turnoff. Like, I, I, I know that time is going to come very soon where it's not a turnoff when people just kind of drop the pretense. And it, because it's not, a, it's not a surrender, it's just like, <laughs> it's just like we're actually kind of leveling up in terms of really playing on the on the level of of this thing that we built like you know it's like okay we're leveling up like now we can we can be jokesters we can be realists we can be everything and it's like our ability to have gone through failed survived <laughs> 
digested but also squeezed that orange and like thrown the juice <laughs> everywhere. Like, it's funny as, it's funny as, fuck. I, I don't know what I can I say mean, on I here. <laughs> I could say the past five years have been pretty demonic, and I think we've all been slightly demonic, <laughs> like slight demons, and we've come out on the other side like, wow, like exorcism and baptism. Am I right, guys? <laughs> like, <Yeah. laughs> and I, I mean, yeah, it's like we all have to look, because it's, you know, the technology is only as powerful as the people who create it, and we give power to the things that, that uh, hold much of the weight in this particular paradigm. So we have to look at ourselves like, it's not the technology, it's not Facebook, it's not YouTube, it's not Instagram, it's not WhatsApp, it's not TikTok, it's us. <laughs> like, it's literally <laughs> us and the way we're interacting with these entities or allowing these entities to, to take hold of us in a very, very scary, uh, inhumane, uncivilized, excuse me, uncivilized way. And this is why the Mennonites were extremely... I've always been obsessed with Mennonites. I used to... I, there's a woman I follow on my eBay. She she's like I, I guess she's like in minnesota and she makes the dresses by hand because they all make everything by hand and i ordered a couple when i was in my earlier 20s because i always thought they were like just a really great silhouette mm. and she's like mm. she's like mennonite mom on ebay that's like her name <laughs> and uh but i always thought you know you look at the amish and you look at mennonites and she writes and you're like they're so behind but it's like actually no they've actually got the right idea they're like, no, 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 no. We only do what we can. Mm -hmm. And they're very close to the land, close to the things they build, close to the literature they read. So they're able to embody all of it. They build their own homes. They, you know, they, they cultivate their own land. They grow their own, they, they feed their own cattle. They're rallying their own lives. And if, if they do happen to invent something or come across something, a way of a procedure that makes their lives easier, it's all, it's all in their own due process. It isn't because some external factor told you this would make your life easier. They're very aware of what makes life worth living to them. And because, as I said in the, in the essay, um, these colonies emerged from feudal order. They were like, oh, we don't want to do that. We don't want to be beholden to uh, an overlord. We don't want all of our work to be outsourced to someone else who won't necessarily appreciate it. So what can we do for ourselves? What can we build for ourselves? How can we maintain a sense of self um, on a smaller scale? Like they kind of they kind of invented deglobalization. <laughs> like they were like, no, no, no. Like let's let's not do that. Let's actually just keep this small and um, and tight and compact and utopic. I mean, it isn't. I wouldn't say it's utopic in a in a true degree, but. For what it is that they're trying to conserve, it is. But the Amish, I think, are the, more, the most utopic in their perspective, or the most like universalistic in the way they approach it. But Mennonites uh, are actually and Mennonites in reality are more broad in their perspective, are more broad in their distribution. Mennonites, some of them, some colonies in like, I'd say Peru use iPads to teach. Some of them move to uh, really desolate zones in Brazil and don't have running water mm. it depends and as you find as they grow as their colonies grow people within them the inhabitants decide is this the kind of midnight i want to be okay no i'm gonna go make a, either a more obscure midnight colony or i'm going to make one that's more um i'd say interacting with the modern world they get these like choices and with the Amish, if you have this day, I forgot what it's called, you get to go away for a weekend when you're like 16 or 18, and you get to, room shaka, is what it's called, and you get to go and into the city, into contemporary life, and decide when you come back if you want to remain Amish, or, and baptize yourself in the spirit of, of remaining in this union, or you can go outside and be a normal person, it's up to you. Wow. But if you decide that you want to be Amish, and you do the baptismal, and you disobey any of these like ordinances, you're banished forever. <laughs> like you cannot come back. This, you can't see your family. It's over. It's a wrap. Oh my god. <laughs> this sounds like it sounds like some kind of story about someone with magical powers who's like, you can be immortal and you can experience all these things, but you have to give up your magic forever. <laughs> there is a special kind of. I mean, th they must. There must be something covetous about this this lifestyle. Like it, it is. 
I think it's true living. Maybe it's a certain, I would say it's true living, but as a person who works with my hands, being able to really design a life for myself through what I can create, through my own magic, because that is your own magic, what you can create with your own hands and your own mind, the yeah. facilities that are completely relegated to you and you alone. Um, yeah. And then having to be, having to exit that principle to be dependent, to be a dependent cog in an urban machine, which one's better? It's up to you, you know? Yeah, I think it's super, it's really great to even bring that up in this conversation because it, it's just nice to know that like, this is being talked about, <laughs> you know? I can't really speak too much because I don't really know that much about Amish and the Mennonites. I did have a dream, but it was completely influenced by, it was just one of those like, you wrote a piece, I saw the images, and then I had a dream. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> and okay. it was a really beautiful dream. I won't go into the details, but um, basically I was like wandering around uh, an, an Amish town or like, like an Amish area, and uh, I was happy. <laughs> so yeah, I won't go into the dream that much. Um, not to idealize anything, and that's where I think the details, you know, really come into play. However, it's going back to this, this question of, of consumerism and, like, why we also, you know, the, the educated consumer being more conscious of the choices that they make and supporting certain communities and, and appreciating craft and all that. I have this suspicion that this development of taste, like being attracted to lace work or being attracted to knitwear, could actually be satisfied if that person just literally tried to knit something. Like, I know for myself that I was a hoarder of a certain kind of drawing. Like, I would just like click through Pinterest and just like add, 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 add all these drawings of Persian angels. I just really was attracted to how they looked. <laughs> and like a Google thousand it. drawings later, I'm like, wait, okay, what's really going on here? Like, clearly <laughs> I could do this forever, but it's this, it's this attraction to something and then redundantly accumulating it whereas what I actually realized was when I drew it and I like just processed it I was satisfied and I have like a little you know like a little drawing that I did and I can move on <laughs> and and that relationship I mean it's everything that we've said and I think there's a lot to be explored there around, around consumerism and those attractions being real, your, your attractions being very real, but not in the sense that you just want to have more of them, it's that somehow you want to acknowledge them and and add them to to your knowledge, like consume them in a way that brings it deeper into your life. Do you think that, I, I think I missed something. Do you think that's the goal or, or that, that could be a goal? Well, I think, I think it just, for me, it brings up the question of, of, of accumulation. Like when, like fixation. I don't know if everyone experiences this. Mm -hmm. I, tend to be get, I tend to get very fixated on things. And I do too. I was thinking a lot about Sex in the City, actually, because I was talking to my friend about Carrie, and I was like, Carrie doesn't, Carrie's a derelict shopaholic. <laughs> and, and the way she does one thing is the way she does most things. The way she just like incessantly hoards material goods for the sake of like status or 
or like I'd say some kind of social appraisal is the same way she approaches all of her relationships. Mm. Like that's just the way you do one thing is the way you do most things. So if you tend to have this like fixation or this need for control or this uh, addictive nature, it doesn't just permeate the, the, the existence that you're occupying now in, on any platform you engage in or any relationship you engage in, on any uh, vicehood you associate yourself with, you're going to carry the same struggle. Yeah. So, so, so yeah, it's like if you do, you have, the, way you're, the way you're digesting or ingesting these particular values you have to be cognizantly aware of of the reason for your interest. Yeah, yeah. And it probably won't be obvious because if you could, it takes searching. <laughs> yeah, but that takes time. It, to, it takes time. It, it like why you know like as I said in the paper, the Pierre Bourdieu's mode of habitus. Like why is Carrie like that? I presume. Also, there was a spinoff of the show called Carrie Diaries, and it was like her childhood, and she apparently had like a working class childhood, and she probably didn't have as many nice things, and then she kind of like spiraled into this person who just like associated um, material advancement for safety, right? And that also acclimated into her relationships and stuff too. So if, until you're able to take the time to really like process once again, the reason for your acknowledgement or accumulation or appreciation for things, you'll never be satiated by it. You'll never move past it. It'll never mature. It'll always be a hollow obsession. Yeah. Yeah. And and that's what postmodernism breeds, a hollow obsession. But we've like it has become conservative because we don't because we're we're constantly um referentializing it. We're constantly holding on to and preserving this nature, this, this I'd say, disassociative nature, disassociating away from our present reality to constantly referentialize the what if of a past, of a past notion. Yeah. And I think Russell Kirk would have found great dismay in that. He, he would have he really wanted us to focus on the beauty of now or to try to find something interesting about today. Mm. Yeah. Well, let's do it. <laughs> yeah, it takes a lot of clarity. Hopefully we can all find that, right? I think this is a good place to stop. <laughs> what do you think? Yeah, speaking of clarity, I think our connection is really suffering right now. Yeah, I think it's the gods are, are speaking to us. I think we have to end it now. Yeah. So this is this episode of the new cast. Um, I hope you guys enjoyed it. I'm going to do another one pretty soon. Thank you, Winston, for coming on the show. It's been a lovely conversation. Thank the you. internet connection is so unstable. <laughs> Welcome, but, um, well, well, Welcome to the new yeah, cast. Yeah, hopefully we'll be there soon. All right, you guys. It's late here, so I'm going to peace out. <laughs>